So this is kind of a new talk. Some of it's new, some of it's old. Some of it's really old, some of it's new. Um, but I thought it would be a good topic for this audience because I'm hoping that there's some like mathematical types looking for new problems to solve. And it's all kind of like um, based around like computational imaging. So I think everyone here knows this idea of um, designing your, your system software and hardware together. So I forgot how this thing works. You have to point at this. So you have like a, you have some hardware that you have to design with optical physics and some algorithm that you can design. And every time we collaborate with like mathematicians, signal processing folks, they always want to do this part and ignore the hardware design and sort of like, you tell me the problem I want to solve. Totally fair, um, but computational imaging is all about the trade-offs between the two and how they interact with each other. So actually, uh, I think some of the most interesting problems to be solved in computational imaging are really at this interface between how hardware design and algorithm design uh, can work together. And I think that some of this can be mathematically formulated, and we've already seen this um, quite a bit in various talks, um, like not knowing your forward model or uh, this end-to-end -end learning where you try to optimize the hardware in conjunction with the algorithm. Um, so I'm going to like talk about all of this in the realm of all the dark secrets of computational imaging, that uh, when we have a computational imaging system, we try to like model it usually. So maybe it's a simple linear system, so y equals ax. Maybe it's phase retrieval, so y equals absolute value squared of ax. And this A is this forward model or system matrix, which might represent all of the optical hardware that you designed and then the physics that goes behind it. And so in practice, we usually think about um, this A matrix consisting of the physics and the optical design, both of which we know. And so this A matrix should be known if I built the system, right? Like I know my system, I built it. And this is part of my beef with um, all this machine learning stuff is that we try to ignore the fact that we know these A matrices or the system models. And we should use the models when we know them. But the black magic or dark secret is that there's like a third leg of this stool that most of these computational imaging systems don't work unless you do a lot of calibration or some really careful calibration that is often really specific to the system. Like we have had systems where there's only one postdoc in the lab that can adjust the duct tape into the right position to get everything aligned so that we get good images. Um, and if that duct tape is not in the right place, nothing works, even though theoretically everything should be great. I'm talking about the Fourier tachography system that originally started with there was literally a piece of duct tape that only lay could place correctly. Um, so I. I want to pose this as a reproducibility problem, that uh, when we do computational imaging and we want our, our methods to be reproducible, that doesn't just mean that we should post our code online. That means we need to make systems that are easy to reproduce. And that involves making the hardware also accessible, making it cheap and simple, posting the code online, making user-friendly code, but also um, being robust to things like misalignment and uh, and model mismatch, which are not noise. Um, they're like systematic errors from the system model that you've predicted. And so uh, your reproducibility goes down with the number of pieces of duct tape that need to be carefully aligned. Uh, I would also think of like software duct tape, like when you take all of your images and then somebody has to go and like renormalize them or register them first. This all counts. This is all important critical steps that we sweep under the rug because we think that they're not that important. But I would like to start thinking about trying to build those into the design. We know that we're not going to align the system perfectly. So let's try to figure out ways of, of accounting for that in the forward model or like figuring out on the fly from the data that we have rather than a, a super careful physical calibration that then like is useless as soon as somebody sneezes. OK, so this calibration being critical means that I want to think about how to put it into, let's design around it. So let's assume we're not going to build a perfect system the way we designed it. Or maybe we assume that this physics that we used as an approximate model isn't perfect, and there's some stuff beyond the model um, that we're not really modeling because we used a simple physical model. And that doesn't mean I want to use a, a more complicated physical model, but maybe we put into the algorithm the fact that something's going to be a little bit off um, that we're going to be like 
we maybe need to solve for some, some garbage that gets added to the system and try to remove it. Um, okay, so a lot of philosophy, but I want to show you an example. Um, so phase from focus, this is super old. This is like, I think this is literally the first project my lab group did with our like the cheapest microscope that I could buy at the time. It's the oldest infinity corrected Nikon that you can buy. And we were doing phase imaging, so quantitative phase from focus stacks. So you take a stack of images through focus and then reconstruct the quantitative phase. This is be sort of a pretty age-old problem by now. Um, it's a phase retrieval problem. You're trying to solve for x, the complex field of the object, um, from measurements y that are intensity measurements that pass through some system. In this case, the system matrix is just going to describe defocus or propagation in free space. Um, so we were doing this with partially coherent sources. So if you have a, a Kohler illumination setup, meaning that the source is in the Fourier plane of the sample, then that means that uh, your source shape is going to define the spatial coherence at the sample. And so basically, we are doing a partially coherent system in that the source is not a point source. Um, and so you get more light through when you use a bigger source. You get this partially coherent effects in your imaging system. So, so you clean up a lot of speckle artifacts. Um, and you can get higher resolution because that source is bigger. So you're coming in at higher angles at the sample. So the, the light is scattering out to higher angles. So you get to double your NA of your diffraction limited resolution if you have a large source. Um, so it's good to use a big source. Um, sometimes it's because you, you need to. Um, in lithography, sometimes they use it for getting higher resolution or just to get more light through. Um, this is in a biological microscope. But as you see, if I use a coherent model, which is the easy, simple physical model, then uh, it only works for the case where the source is actually coherent. So a small source is a spatially coherent source, and it works well. And then as I change the shape of my source to make it bigger, I just get blurred results. So the idea was put the source shape into the forward model, which we did, and it works well. So if you know the source shape, you can solve for the phase accurately, and you can actually even get some, some benefits from it in terms of better resolution. Um, but you can, you can now like, use any type of source. Okay, so the algorithmic self-calibration part is um, I don't want to have to physically know the source because it's really hard. So um, you can see this is like taken through the eyepiece. I can't seem to get, there we go. Um, this is taken through the eyepiece and you can see it's not a great image of the source. It's kind of like warped and weird. Um, and so it's hard to measure the source shape exactly. You can like predict it from like you know what you told it to be. Um, so we can use that as, uh, as this like source shape um, model, but that all goes into this system matrix or the A matrix. And so the idea is now the A matrix, we want it not to be just like a known A matrix, but it's like a parameterized with a few unknowns. So we know it's a source in the Kohler space, uh, in the Fourier space of the sample that is monochromatic and uh, sort of like all spatially coherent at every point, but we don't know the exact shape of that source. So we're going to solve for that. Um, so Jing Shen doesn't want to calibrate, so he's going to solve an optimization problem that looks like the phase retrieval problem, but also is a, a joint estimation with both the phase, which is this x, that's the complex field we're solving for, and then theta, which are the parameters of the source that we're trying to get at, which is just the source shape in this case. So this is a, a joint estimation. So if I knew the source, I could solve for the object, I could solve for the quantitative phase. If I knew the object, I could solve for the source. Um, since I'm trying to solve for both, the simplest way and probably the laziest and possibly the worst way mathematically is to do this joint estimation technique where you solve for one, fix one, solve, even if it's wrong, solve for the other, fix that one, solve for the other, fix that one, solve for the other. And you can prove that it will not diverge in this case. So it's not guaranteed to converge, but it won't diverge. And it does converge. Um, it pretty much, as long as something's changing, it's going in the right direction. So you can keep iterating until you get convergence. Um, and this should work. And it does work. Um, so uh, here's the original uh, with our measured sources. And here's with our self-calibrated sources. And the point here is that actually the self-calibration works better. So this is what got me going on this track, is that um, you would think that knowing the source and not solving a joint estimation problem for both the phase and the source would be better because you have more information. But actually, we are getting better results when we solve for both jointly. And that's basically because I think like our measurements of the known source were not that great. Um, and so I think this is a really interesting um, result to, to think about how uh, this sort of like 
having more unknowns can be better if your system isn't perfect. Um, and this is a great example of self-calibration. So now I'll get into slightly more modern. This is like a few years later, still pretty old. Um, so this is our old Brightfield microscope again. And now it's an LED array microscope. So I, I think a lot of people have already seen this or heard about it. It's basically just your regular Brightfield microscope and we made one hardware change that we swapped out the illumination unit with this LED array. We copied this from a group at Caltech. Um, and the LED array, the Adafruit's literally a toy company. So we now have a startup that will sell you fancier, much better LED arrays. Um, but this is how we started. Uh, and the point is that the LED array just sits above the sample. And as you turn on different LEDs, each LED illuminates the sample pretty homogeneously with essentially a plane wave at the sample. Um, but uh, they're all coming from different angles. So you're patterning the illumination angles at the sample um, by turning on different LEDs. So this disco party pattern looks random. I'll explain what it is later. Uh, but this computational illumination platform has been really useful. And our group and a number of others have been working on all kinds of different imaging modalities that come from just turning on different LEDs and then capturing images and reconstructing images in different ways. Um, so you can do all, all kinds of different contrast modes. You can do this gigapixel or Fourier tachography imaging, and then 3D, which I'll get into a little later. But this Fourier tachography is probably the coolest thing. This is why we built the thing, to, to try Fourier tachography. So you start with this low resolution microscope. You put a low NA objective in the microscope. And then, of course, you're not resolving the smallest features. But then you do the disco party illumination and take a video. This is the video you capture. And what I want you to note from this video is that all these images are low resolution, but they're all different. So we are getting some diversity in our measurements as we change the illumination. We're not getting higher resolution in any one image, but when we take this video and solve with our reconstruction algorithm, we can reconstruct, this is I think seven times higher resolution in each dimension uh, from taking more images uh, with different illumination. So your final resolution actually amounts to the diffraction limited resolution, not of the set by the NA of your microscope objective, but set by the sum of the NA of the objective and the, detect and the illumination. So now if you use large NA illumination, like if you can go out to 180 degrees, which is what our, our startup companies domes do, that's the whole point, then you can sort of like get a plus one on your illumination. And so you can get much higher resolution here. And so if you intentionally start with very low resolution, that means you get to keep a very big field of view. Then you can build out what we call gigapixel imaging because you can build out like towards a gigapixel of, of like space bandwidth product um, by having this low NA objective that has big field of view and then building it out to NA of one by taking a lot of images at different angles. So I think a lot of people know tachography and or Fourier tachography, but I'll just go through it. So this is your samples Fourier space. So the spatial frequency in X, spatial frequency in Y. And obviously um, you can't collect all of the spatial frequencies in a sample. So you have your microscope objective has some numerical aperture, which limits the bandwidth here. So spatial frequency, you can be think, thinking of it exactly like range of angles. So the NA of your microscope limits the range of angles you can collect, and that will limit the spatial frequencies that you can collect to be, being within this green circle. And that's why your image is low resolution, because you only have a small range of spatial frequencies set by that low NA objective. So when I illuminate from off axis, what I'm doing is hitting the sample with a phase ramp. So I multiply the sample with a phase ramp and then beautifully Fourier shift theory says that everything shifts in Fourier space. So what it amounts to is just capturing a different circle of the Fourier space, which is shifted. And so this is sub resolution information, but it's still all within this small green circle. So it's still a low resolution image, but it's lighting up all the sub resolution features in this particular dimension. If I light up this LED up here, I get all of the horizontal features, sub resolution features lit up. And then what I'm going to do oops, is just take a picture with each LED on. So turn on one LED, take a picture, turn on the next LED, and I'm going to spiral them outwards for, uh, say, I have LEDs out to this dotted circle um, of spatial frequencies or illumination angles. Then I can fill in this much bigger circle. Bigger circle, bigger bandwidth means higher resolution. But to get the higher resolution, I will need to do an inverse Fourier transform. 
I need phase to do an inverse Fourier transform. So this stitching the circles together is called synthetic aperture. And then these circles are all severely overlapping because we also need to do a phase retrieval. And the overlapping of the circles allows us to solve a phase retrieval problem from this data set. So um, it's exactly like tachography, except sh instead of shifting the field of view, we are shifting the aperture um, by turning on different LEDs. Beautifully practical because we only have to turn on different LEDs as we go. And then we can solve, for, solve an optimization problem for the complex field of the object. We actually solve for the complex field of the object in Fourier space, um, just for convenience. And so then we can just do an inverse Fourier transform once we have phase and amplitude. Okay, so that's not algorithmic self-calibration. Algorithmic self-calibration is this. We're gonna solve for the object and solve for this pupil function, P of U. So P of U is, is a pupil function. So you might know that it's all within a, a circular aperture, um, but also maybe that circular aperture has, is not exactly where it's supposed to be. So we do algorithmic self-calibration for angles. So when I turn on an LED at a particular angle, I might actually be hitting the sample slightly off angle. Um, when we're looking at biological samples, they're sitting in like a bath of water or some liquid and the liquid surface may not be flat. And so when the light comes in, it refracts to a slightly different angle. And uh, you can imagine, I need to know that circle placement pretty exactly. If I get it wrong, then I'm just gonna smear out all of the Fourier components here. So we actually solve for the, the circle's position and then also the wavefront, uh, the wavefront within that circle. So basically the wavefront pupil function is the aberration function. Um, so we're gonna solve for that as well and then we can digitally undo the, uh, the aberrations. So how you solve this optimization is really important. Um, this is an example when I reduce the amount of data I'm putting into the setup. If I'm using these like basic methods like gradient descent, um, basically Gertrude Saxton is, is a gradient descent with a particular step size, then I can solve really fast, but I get weird artifacts when I try to reduce the data. Um, if you use second order methods, you always do better. So it takes forever. Um, but you get a better result. We don't have time to wait for this. This is only a tiny patch of this huge like gigapixel image that we might do like on a video loop. So this is too slow. Um, here's some commentary, fast versus exact. I have to start it over, I think. Um, so that second dog that gets in the door first because it, it goes in the right direction, um, that's my analogy for uh, quasi-second order methods like Gauss-Newton, which is what we actually use. So all the results you're seeing are quasi-second order methods. And they're like pretty fast, but they give us pretty good results. Um, and it was a good trade-off for us. Uh, yeah, cute, but it's too slow. So um, I said we have to turn on one LED and capture each image individually. We want to look at biological samples that are alive. And so you have some time, they're pretty slow, like cells moving around in a petri dish, depends what kind of cells, of course, but yeah, the kind of things we're targeting are pretty slow. You have seconds to capture the data, but not minutes. And this was taking tens of minutes. And so we wanted to make it faster. Um, and we went after this redundancy. So the pupil overlap, so these circles are all severely overlapping. And you can show that that's absolutely necessary for the phase retrieval to work. It's exactly the same as in regular tychography. Um, but what it amounted to is we were collecting 10 times more data than we were reconstructing. So compressed sensing is like you reconstruct more data than you collect. This is the opposite. It's like 10x overdetermined. It's not really overdetermined because it's not a linear system because we're doing a phase retrieval. But we need that overlap so we can't just reduce which data we capture, which images. So what we started to do was think about, okay, let's like capture more things at once. Um, so we have this method, differential phase contrast, DPC, where you turn on a half circle of LEDs and you turn on another half circle and then you can solve for phase out to 2x to like twice the NA. So you get double the resolution um, for just two images, really three to make it properly robust, three half circles. So that's a good value, three images, twice the resolution. Beyond that, it doesn't, this DPC doesn't work. So we started doing randomly multiplexing. So turn on eight random LEDs, eight other ones from what's remaining, eight other ones until we filled them all in. So then uh, that's what this disco party pattern is. And this is our like heuristic multiplexing approach. So we chose eight because you get, then you get eight times faster capture. Um, you get uh, eight times brighter illumination. So you can make your exposure time eight times less. So you get almost a factor of 100 in speed up. Plus some hardware changes, we got more than 100 factor in speed up. Um, 
And the eight was because I said we had 10x redundancy. So eight is almost 10. We kept a little bit of redundancy in there so that makes this fairly robust. Um, but we can now like almost get to a one-to-one -one data capture to data reconstruction rate. Uh, and that allows us to look at live samples. These are HeLa cells. You can see this one, uh, it's gonna curl up in a ball. You can see it's like dividing there. That's the biology 101 mitosis. And then it curls up in a ball and splits into multiple cells. Um, this is pretty cool because we're getting the same resolution as an ADX microscope objective would normally get, but now we get it across this massive uh, field of view area. Okay, um, so uh, the next step, so that was still like pretty old work. Now we're finally getting to something a little bit newer, 2019. Um, so Michael Kelman uh, figured out how to do what we call the end-to-end -end learning. Um, basically, figure out what are the best illumination patterns to use. So I showed you that, that disco party pattern, which was our heuristic source pattern set, but that was just designed by like us. And it worked okay, it helped a lot. It's better than doing one at a time. But we wanted to like get the final answer, what is the best pattern of LEDs to display? So say I'm only going to take 10 images. So full measurement, one at LED at a time would be 89 measurements in this case. And this is the reconstructed quantitative phase you would get. Um, so if we just, I don't have it here, um, but if you just took less data, it just won't work. Um, but if we use these data-driven designs, which is this set of LED array patterns for taking 10 images, then we can do almost as well quality-wise uh, and much faster capture. And I think it's really interesting to think about why these patterns look the way they did. I was a little bit surprised at these results, but we can also kind of explain it in retrospect. Um, so this end-to-end -end learning I find really interesting, and it's a little bit like the self-calibration in that you can design it for a particular algorithm. So it will learn the intricacies of your algorithm, the best data design, cap capture design, um, given what your algorithm is gonna do to screw up the reconstructions. Okay, so now we're getting to like take less data. Our system is becoming more efficient. That's a good thing. Uh, you could go even further and take less data than you reconstruct and do essentially compressed sensing. But then you're running into these problems that come with, with compressed sensing, that you make your system extremely efficient. That's what computational imaging is all about. And then sort of by definition, you're also making the system really fragile. So you have one small error in your measurements and it can propagate to like really weird, bad artifacts in your reconstruction. And so uh, I wanted to start thinking about this algorithmic self-calibration for this particular case. And um, we sort of did them separately. The LED positions was really important. So if you, if you don't calibrate the positions, you don't get any of the super resolution benefits because it's all just blurred out by, by errors. Um, if you do calibrate the LED positions or like the angles of illumination, and we did that, uh, I'm not gonna explain how we did that, it was just a, a circle matching in Fourier space, then uh, you get a much better result and you need this. So this is a, one of these pieces of duct tape. You need it to get a good result, but we don't really talk about it a lot of times. Um, so it's this calibration parameters of our forward matrix. So we, we're modeling the whole system, but we're saying like the LED position is approximately known, but not exact. So find, so, so find it within a small range around where it's supposed to be. Um, so these are fairly efficient optimization problems to solve. Um, you don't want to calibrate it physically, so we're going to do it from the data itself. And we already have built in some redundancy into our data. We took, we're still taking more data than we reconstruct, and part of that I said was for robustness, part of that is for this, so that we can solve for extra things like the calibration parameters. Um, and aberrations can make things really messy, um, particularly because we're talking about systems that are low NA objectives with big fields of view, so they can have really bad aberrations that are space variant. Um, luckily, we do all of our reconstructions on a patch by patch basis. So actually, we can do this joint solving of the quantitative phase and the LED array positions. So the LED array positions are global for, for the whole field of view. And the aberrations, uh, so the aberrations will be done on a patch by patch basis. So this is the wavefront phase that we've solved for after doing this joint estimation. Um, and it will be different for each patch. So another patch over here towards the edge of the, closer to the edge of the field of view should have worse aberrations, which it does. And they're sort of like tilted in the direction you would expect. Here's the map of all of the wavefront aberrations at every sort of like patch's position within the field of view. 
Um, and we're just doing these joint optimizations on a patch by patch basis. So it's fairly straightforward. And it makes sense. You have more aberrations towards the outsides. You can fit to the Zernikes if you want to, um, or you can solve for the Zernikes if you want to, to make everything more constrained. Okay, so um, the last part of this is I want to go into 3D imaging. And the 3D case is like, I'm illuminating from different angles, but I had to assume my sample was thin to assume this like shifting property in Fourier space. So I didn't talk about that, but I was assuming that. If the sample's thick, then as I illuminate from different angles, I'm going to be projecting through the sample differently, which means that I'm gonna just like see different things about the sample, right? So as you change your illumination, then everything that's in focus stays where it is. If you change your illumination and something's off focus, then it's gonna shift with the focus, with the illumination angle, right? The further away it is, the more it shifts. So this is a, a 3D sample that's just two resolution targets on either side of focus. So as I change my illumination angles, then they, they appear to shift, right? And your eye can pick up on this, right? Like your eye can kind of guess relative distances from this. So there is 3D information there. But there's also this like higher resolution. So we wanna do super resolution and 3D, so tomography and um, and uh, uh, this uh, Fourier tachography super resolution, which we can do. But what I want to say about self calibration is like if you think about it, if your angle, if your illumination angle is a little bit off for the in focus plane, um, it's just going to be like your Fourier space will be a little bit messed up. But if you're in the off focus plane, then if your illumination angle is off from what it's predicted, then this, this shifting effect will be like much bigger, right? So the further you are off focus, the more shifting you get. So with a tiny change in angle, you can get a big physical shift in the, the, the part of the image that corresponds to that depth. And so for 3D reconstruction, this angle calibration was even more essential. It, it was like, uh, you can't get any, everything just looks like total garbage unless you're doing this fairly accurately. You also need to do it more accurately in the 3D case. And that was sometimes what was limiting how far we could go in the third dimension. So here's some 3D ref refractive index reconstructions of embryos after we've done all of this correction. This is just sweeping through different depths and showing you the refractive index. You can see like two cells on top and two on bottom. These are four cell embryos. Um, and the beauty of doing this in 3D I think is that, uh, so, so you can treat this like a, a huge nonlinear neural network. Um, basically like each node is the amplitude and phase. You need to solve for the amplitude and phase at each node within this 3D block, like discretized block. And then you can like predict how the light's gonna propagate between the, between the different nodes and then you take intensity at the end. So uh, it's kind of like the whole, the whole like learning the 3D um, the 3D refractive index in every position is a lot like training a big deep neural network if you want it to sound cooler. Uh, but it also has all the problems that it's super nonlinear, super non-convex. We don't really know when and where it will converge, but we kind of just try it and see when we kind of know when it works or it doesn't work. Um, so that's a problem, a math problem that I can't solve. Uh, but one thing that's really beautiful is that it accounts for multiple scattering. So the light can, oops, the light can bounce around between these, between different lateral positions as, as it propagates, it can bounce backwards, and we can model all of that. So modeling multiple scattering in our forward model gives us a chance to solve for getting rid of it in our reverse model. And this is kind of a, an example of extreme self-calibration because you're, you're removing all of the sample-induced aberrations in 3D as the light propagates through the sample. So I want to say that like, when you do 3D phase imaging, um, phase is a projecting quantity. So 3D phase imaging is really 3D refractive index imaging. Maybe it sounds less cool. But once you're solving for 3D refractive index, that is the scattering potential. Like this N of R is, is your scattering potential. And so you're solving for all of the scattering events deterministically within the sample. And so I think this is really cool because it means if you can measure all of the 3D refractive index variations through the sample, you can computationally undo all of the scattering through the sample. So this is calibrating out all of the scattering in a given sample. As you can imagine, this is just not going to work if you try to do too much. So the, the degrees of freedom for scattering as you go through a sample increases exponentially as you add more and more 
or layers or scattering events. And so uh, we don't know when and where this will work. We kind of just try heuristically. I would love to have more theory on that, but because it's nonlinear, we don't. And so uh, we just sort of like try it and see where it works. And it seems to fail fairly gracefully. Uh, but here's an example. This is a 15 gigavoxel reconstruction of a C. elegans. So uh, this is just the central slice of the 3D refractive index that we solved for. And you can see a lot. This is the refractive index. Here's a, a scale bar. Um, so you can see there's a lot of refractive index, large refractive index variations inside the center of this sample. And the point is that if we try to just image into this sample at this plane, we won't be able to clearly resolve anything because of the sample-induced scattering. But now we're digitally removing it through this, uh, through this scattering models in our forward model. And so we can get a nice clear image to the whole 3D volume. OK, so last thing that I want to talk about uh, is like whenever, so there, I think there's not a lot of biologists here today, but whenever I talk to biologists, they're like, oh, can I use this for my like G camp? Or like, they always want to do fluorescence. And they're always like, oh, I'm going to try this on my fluorescent. And it doesn't work for fluorescence. Fluorescence doesn't care what illumination angle you come in at. It will just fluoresce isotropically. Um, and I think that uh, fluorescence information is very different. So I think of phase or refractive index information as structural. It gives you a sense of like the density and morphology of the sample. Whereas fluorescence is about function. So you can like tag things functionally, figure out where, um, where different things are moving through the, through the sample. And so fluorescence and phase are really complementary. And there's uh, more recently been people trying to do both at once. And I think that can be really valuable, particularly when we're trying to build data sets and like, take data for machine learning models who might be able to figure more things out if they have both. Um, but also, you can think of it as doing phase imaging for the sake of correcting all of the scattering in the fluorescence measurements. So you have all this sample-induced scattering. So like, I think phase imaging is more important than that. But you could use it just to do the corrections of the fluorescence sample for license reconstructions. So you can't illuminate from different angles on uh, fluorescence and get any, any change in result. But you can do structured illumination. So my original idea was like, let's put some diffuser in, on top of the sample, and then we're going to illuminate it from different angles. And that will create a speckle pattern. And as you illuminate from different angles, the speckle pattern will shift around and change the illumination. And so it's structured illumination, speckle structured illumination. Um, and you can change it. You can shift it around by changing your illumination angles. Um, we originally tried to do it with the LED array because everything would be nice, compact in one system. But the LEDs just were not bright enough. So we started using lasers. And we needed finer angle sampling. So we're using lasers to do this, um, to, to do this illumination. But it goes through scotch tape, which is our diffuser. Turned out to be like a good type of diffuser here to get this speckle illumination. And it achieves the same purpose. So scotch tape uh, scatters light. And it scatters light to some range of angles that's represented by some numerical aperture. So that is now your illumination numerical aperture. And we get the same equation. We can get the diffraction limited resolution. That's the sum of the NAs of the objective and the illumination. Um, so we didn't go for like 10x super resolution. We went for 4x. Uh, we didn't always even get there. We had to do a lot of calibration. So we have like basically two cameras here whose only job is to calibrate that speckle for us. And then we're shifting it across the screen by changing the angle and taking this fluorescent data. Um, so here's the uh, floor. So then we can solve for both phase and fluorescence because we had that calib those calibration cameras to measure the coherent light. That was the illumination light. We can just get phase retrieval with that. Um, and we can do that in our like super resolution mode too, because structured illumination works fine for, for complex fields. Um, so just zooming in on this is a simple sample with beads. Um, but you can see this is the resolution you would have had on the bottom. And this is the resolution that we get out of it. Um, and it's just four times two in each direction. Sorry, four in each direction, four times better. OK. Uh, you can do all of this in 3D just by, by uh, calibrating the speckle through three dimensions. We just go through focus to do that, so it takes a longer time. But then we get this, th we just take our data, now it's just 3D data. Um, this is XZ, and with our super resolution, we can get better axial resolution and better lateral resolution. 
Okay, so this is self-calibrated in the same way. If I knew the, the illumination patterns, I could solve the speckle structure illumination problem easily. If I knew the object, I could solve for the speckle patterns, and then I would know the speckle patterns I could solve for the object, right? So it's the same idea of this joint optimization. This one's a little more complicated, so we impose, I don't really want to get into the details, but we're going to try to estimate the patterns of illumination, but we have some blank spaces, so we can't always estimate them everywhere. Um, and then we use, this is important, so there's a, some statistical assumptions that come in here, that you assume that the mean of all the speckle patterns is, is just flat. And so you need a lot of speckle patterns to get the mean to be flat enough for this to be an accurate assumption. And that's sort of probably the Achilles heel of this technique, that it takes a long time to capture all of those images to make sure that your mean is flat enough. Um, but then you can get your, uh, you can get solved for both the patterns and the, the reconstructed super resolution image. Okay, so yeah, you have to capture a lot of images. And it's kind of silly because you're stochastically trying to like get to like flat mean. And so the flatter you want it, the many, 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 like you're like highly leveraged on how many more images you have to take. So like my kid gets really upset about things being too slow. Um, and so Rimming, who's here, back there, is working on a totally different way of thinking about this that I think is really um, like modern and exciting. So he's saying, let's do speckle structured illumination. So illuminate with this scotch tape speckle. But like maybe the scene is dynamic. So maybe for we can use this for like things flowing through a flow channel or like anything that's moving. So as long as the, the scene is moving, as long as the object is moving, and it doesn't have to be a rigid body object, as long as it's moving and changing in time, it's going to pass through different parts of the, that static speckle illumination. And you should be able to get the super resolution benefits um, just by like uh, knowing that the object's going to see different speckles. Different parts of the object will see different speckles as they move. And the hard part of this is getting it to work for like non-rigid body unknown motion. So we need to jointly solve now for the motion and the, the uh, super resolution image. Um, okay, so this speckle illumination, we measure it beforehand, so it's pre-calibrated and it doesn't change. And that is a very, very valuable. So we don't need to take a whole bunch of images just to get like figure out what the speckle is. We're going to pre-calibrate it once and we know it. Um, and so then we have all these acquired images. We're trying to reconstruct a whole video. So it's a space-time method. We're trying to solve for, for space over time. And we're going to exploit redundancies in that. So if you look at something like a little C. elegans worm here crawling across the screen, then uh, if you look at successive frames, they're very similar. So this redundancy of videos is what we would like to explore, exploit. Um, and so what we do is we model this as basically you've got some worm that's a thing. And then you have these, like, at every frame, you have the same worm, but it's moved a little bit from the previous frame. So we're just going to try to solve for the scene, which is the worm, and the, the motion at every frame. So, uh, and there's some caveats as things go off the edge of the frame, but let's not worry about those. But that's what we're trying to solve for, the scene and the motion maps over time. Uh, so you put into some black magic. Um, the black magic are these, like, uh, MLPs. So multi-layer perceptrons, they're like the trendy new thing in machine learning that I don't understand at all. I think Ruming understands them a little bit, but it seems like nobody fully understands them. Uh, but we have two. So we have one for the motion, one for the scene. We're trying to solve for both the scene and the motion um, via these like space-time coordinates. And uh, we put in all of the data that we have and update these network weights as we go. And somehow it sometimes works. Um, so here's our pre-calibrated speckle scene. And then this is just simulation, so we have ground truth. We ha and this is the quantitative phase that's being solved. And then you can see the mo how this thing is changing in motion. Um, whoops. And here's some, whoops, what's going on? Here's some experimental data. So here's something flowing. And you can see the, the raw data changing, and then we can reconstruct the, the higher resolution. So we got almost two times better resolution in experiment and we're going to work on new experiments. But I think this is really uh, exciting to think about. Um, like these MLPs in particular are really useful for learning things that like you know are no low rank, but you don't know how to model them. And I think that's uh, a really nice way to blend this like 
physical models that we know with like deep learning to learn everything else. And so try to like design your net neural network architectures appropriately. Um, and my outlook on this is let's start talking about our dark secrets, start, start thinking about trying to put them uh, into algorithms and account for them in the design process of the imaging system. So thanks to my group who did most of the work, um, my collaborators and then my anti-collaborators who we went to the Santa Monica Pier last night and watched the roller coaster but didn't ride it. <laughs> so happy to take any questions.